All right. Very sorry about that. Some people are joining back up. I'm not 100% certain why I'm having technical difficulties with the display today. It was fine yesterday. Boy, that took me over 20 minutes. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started here finally. So um, finally got the, uh, uh, the video up here. Uh, you guys can still hear me okay um, on audio? Somebody can just let me know about that. Yeah, and let me share my screen here and we'll get started and see if anybody has any questions. Yep, yeah, okay. Um, all right. Okay, um, so I, I had planned to go over the first assignments, um, see if anybody had questions about that first, and then we would talk about um, the stuff for this week, right? So we can go over the um, collection materials, notebooks, and start thinking about assignment two, but um, but I might not talk about that unless some people have some questions on that. I don't know if anybody's <laughs> gotten up to starting on assignment two. Um, I, um, yeah, so the assignment one is done. Um, I got, assignments from almost everybody. I had three, maybe four missing. So I am assuming that most everybody, except for maybe them, uh, that, that those three or four have got a working, um, um, you know, Python environment uh, and, and they're able to work on the assignments and things. Let me go ahead and bring up my environment here. So just as a reminder, um, if you're using the dev box that I had you guys set up, uh, you guys will probably be in repos instead of boxes if you follow my suggestion. But you know, if you want to restart up your box, just change into that repository directory and always use the vagrant commands um, to uh, boot back up your virtual box and, and your JupyterHub server inside your virtual box. So, um, And um, it's not quite booted up yet, but um, um, but, but yeah, so once you get your prompt back, uh, as long as you see the, um, the forwarding uh, of the port up here, and this gives you a hint of which port number you should be looking on your local host to find your Jupyter Hub. But if you have that, and if you see the shared folders being mounted, you're probably good to go to try and um, connect. So, um, um, Sometimes, you know, you can get a little glitch. I mean, you can always reload the current page to kind of uh, refresh the Jupyter Hub just in case you need to. Um, all right, so yeah, oh, I, okay. So I posted the, uh, the solution up there. Um, and I thought, I'd, I mean, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. I'll see if, if people have any questions on this though. So. Anybody will ask a little bit about um, these four problems that we had here. So, this is a little bit tough on a single screen. I have to figure out there's a better way to do this. Um, all right, so general things, um, a few people did have problems with a notebook um, that didn't run all the cells correctly. So, I mean, I kind of consider that a fundamental thing. So that was one of the things in the evaluation rubrics, the evaluation check marks. Uh, hopefully everybody could, everybody could find that. Um, you know, so I gave a little bit of feedback sometimes, but usually, and you know, I've got quite a few people in this class, so usually, you know, I'll, I'll go through the rubrics and uh, I'll also post an example solution 
uh, and leave it up to you to kind of examine the example solution. And, um, you know, if you have further questions on, you know, something that you didn't understand on your own, you know, to ask me about it, let me know. So some people um, were not running the, you know, their, their notebook had a problem in it. So, so you do need to make certain that your notebook runs correctly from top to bottom. So, you know, even if you have like a syntax error in a cell, you know, you should always be able to um, like, um, hit the, the double fast arrow here. That'll restart the kernel and it'll rerun all the cells. That's the quickest way to do that, right? Um, and, and you should never be to the point where, um, um, oh, I meant to comment this. Oh, I got to comment out. So this one cell will take a little bit of time to the example of timing the thing. But, you know, you, you should never have a notebook that when you run the whole thing, um, it stops halfway through and doesn't run all the cells because... You know, I can't really tell without fixing your error uh, whether stuff after that point, you know, is correct or not. And, and you know, I, I might not be able to know how to fix the, the error that you have in the cell. So it really is up to you. Yeah, up, up to you. Your responsibility makes it that, that all the cells run cleanly. So if, if you do that, um, you know, you should check and, 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 and see that everything's run. And if and if it had stopped somewhere and everything is not run, you should fix that cell uh, before you submit um, your work for, for future assignments. So, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, anyway, just check that in general. So, so when you run that, you should find that um, all the cells all the way down to the last one might take some time, but but uh, they'll eventually will all run depending on what kinds of calculations you've got to do and stuff. So like that. So so here, I mean, this one did run that time all the way down here, um, the, and the last cell I can tell because it has a number, which means that this was the forty second cell that ran, um, and I had output for all of these, you know, after all these cells, including the last one. Um, another thing, so um, another general comment, I had three or four notebooks turned in. Um, so if you if you click up here, uh, hopefully everybody can see this here. I do, I'm sharing my screen, right? Yes. Um, but yeah, if you click up here, or you can also go to, you know, kernel uh, and change kernel, you get the same thing. This allows you to select different Python kernels, what are called kernels. So these are just like separate environments um, that you can set up to have like different libraries installed or, or different configurations of things. So um, anyway, I mean, you know, we should be using the Python 3 data sci um, kernel is what I had set up for the, the, the dev box, the Jupyter Hub on the dev box that I, did, that I gave you guys. So, um, so what I was getting at is that a couple people um, turned in notebooks that by default was using just a Python 3 kernel or a kernel with a, a different name that I didn't have in the dev box. That tells me that, that maybe some people set up their own environment, you know, so installed Conda or, or installed your own Python uh, in JupyterHub, which is, is okay with me, but um, I mean, I did give these dev, dev box for a reason. Um, so, you know, if your stuff doesn't run, in my environment that I set up for the, uh, the, the for the class, you know, so you know, so there can be problems if you don't have the same versions of the libraries and things. So, so I kind of consider the dev box as the default implementation, you know, the, the default versions and standard for the class. So I'm just saying that you know it's a little bit risky if you're not using the dev box, you know. So so if you have something that's that's a problem because of a incompatible version that works in your environment but doesn't work on the dev box, you know, I consider it not. I'm, I'm not going to go and debug problems with uh, you know incompatible versions or things like that. You know. So so the dev box versions of stuff I gave you are the canonical versions, and it needs to run on that. And if it doesn't, if you're not using the dev box. And it doesn't run. I mean, you might lose points. So, so you should just, just be aware of that. And I would, I would encourage you to get the dev box to work. I mean, if, if you didn't, if you uh, installed your own stuff, because it's uh, just in general, it's good to. Uh, so it's becoming 
this is just a general thing for graduate students, but, but virtualization, knowing how to use virtualization. So, so this stuff is useful, whether you're throwing up a virtual machine on the cloud or something like that, you know, so, so this has become very common. So just being able to know your way around and be able to use these kinds of tools, uh, virtual machines in different configuration things um, for like open science and, and reproducible research and stuff like that is, is all in there. So I mean, that's not really the goal of this class, but you get a little bit of a of, of a familiarity with that. Um, if um, if um, you um, uh, use the, the 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 environment that I've set up uh, for you, so uh, okay. So I'm, I've had some direct messages here. Um, so I mean, all of these deadlines and stuff are in detail on the class. So, you know, it's your responsibility to be checking um, our class site, uh, look for deadlines, uh, make certain you're up on stuff, you know, and of course you can, I mean, I talked about this in our last help session uh, and then the first help, the, the first class meeting, right? So, so the, 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 the assignment was announced and everything. So, but, but you definitely need to be checking D2L and stuff uh, for assignments and things. So, you know, I'm not too certain how people might've missed it, um, but, um, but, but yeah, those are all up there and it's your responsibility to, uh, to, you know, know about deadlines, to be checking, um, our class regularly, um, and so on. So. Um, all right. So I don't know if there's any other general, th oh, there was one other general thing and I did take some points off for this. Uh, I'll probably continue doing this, um, so, I mean, I do want people to get, again, this is kind of more of a pet peeve maybe of mine, but um, I mean, I do want people to get in the habit of giving documentation strings. So, so these are called uh, PyDoc strings, or Python documentation strings. So just for these assignments, I mean, in general, you should do that, whatever code you're writing, you know, whenever you're writing functions or member functions, you really should document them. Um, it's becoming pretty standard to have at least like a description and then you document input parameters to the function and then you document the return values from the function. Right? So I have that as a check mark and I'll probably continue to have that on there. I mean, just, just give me the function documentation and give me a minimum of, of um, for, for any function that you have to write for these assignments. Um, um, and, and give me a minimum of, you know, some description and, and list the parameters and, and describe them that come into the function. Um, and the return values that the, the function is computing or returning back, right? So I, I think I mentioned it somewhere that, um, you know, it's, for trivial functions, okay, it's probably fine. And, and it's a bit of a judgment call, what's trivial, what's not. Um, so if, you, if you're in doubt, you probably just want to put something there for these assignments. Uh, I mean, just always do it. Yeah. But but a trivial function like a, like a like an f of x that's like a almost like a lambda function that's just for one code line. Okay, may, maybe you don't really need it for that. But but otherwise, uh, most of these functions like like uh, especially if I give you the function and uh, you know I give you what the the name of the function and the signature of the function is and the, the documentation, you should go ahead and include that documentation. Or uh, if I if I don't give that to you, if I ask you to write a function, you should. Uh, write some PyDoc documentation for it. Um, that'll be the last time I'll probably mention that, but but yeah, just give me those because I'm, I'm just trying to get people into good habits. Um, so it, it helps give context to people, even your future self, if you come back, you know, so this helps me all the time or come back to these notebooks to remember exactly what these functions are doing and what the parameters are supposed to be that are coming in and that kind of stuff. So. Now that, that, that's part of the documentation, I mean, in, in the code, but that's also, you know, part of um, these Jupyter notebooks, uh, the, the, these notebooks in general, of course, you can also document your work by using code, by using uh, markdown cells and have an actual written description of things as well. Um, okay, so I don't think I have to go over the first problem, um, I mean, of everybody that submitted it, I mean, everybody did get the basic idea. So they were, so you figured out to either pass, you pass in a dictionary, you use the dictionary passed in like I showed here. Um, it turns out that it's a little bit inefficient 
um, when I did some things uh, to pass in the dictionary as a second parameter and to be passing that into all the recursive function calls. So I had an implementation that uh, was slightly different from the signature that I gave you for the assignment, uh, but, but, but they both work pretty much in a similar way, right? So uh, th this is a, a technique known as memoization, which you, know, you may or may not have run across, uh, but the standard kind of thing. So instead of recalculating work that's already been done, you use a lookup table. Um, and the first time you need to calculate something, you calculate it, but then you put it into your lookup table or your database. And thereafter, you always just look it up instead of redoing those calculations. So that's that's kind of the heart of memoization. And you can use a dictionary or you can use something more um, sophisticated for that lookup table, you know, like an actual database or something to back your your thing there. But I think everybody pretty much had that one. I don't remember taking off any points for the first one. Um, So I don't know, likewise, I mean, most people had this, um, at least in their final version. So I don't know how easy or how difficult it was for people to figure all these out. Um, this is difficult for these assignments. Um, you know, so I'll often give, um, you know, some, some examples of what the output should be if you get the function right or, or if you get the calculation right for a cell, you know, so. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, after everybody works through this, hopefully you, you kind of understand, I mean, you know, so this was walking you through the steps, uh, to set up so that you could get the calculation right for the third one, um, using, um, vectorized operations, right? So, um, I mean, probably the most difficult stuff was was at the very end of, of the problem two here because we're, you know i had you get into using a, a boolean mask um for these numpy arrays right so i i don't know again i don't know the experience of people uh doing this but but often just doing an example of this uh becomes a lot easier to understand than trying to kind of explain what it's what's happening here so so these are pretty powerful and we'll use this a lot, uh, uh, like, like a Boolean mask like this. Uh, so the basic idea being that I want to do some calculation on a, an array of items, but I only want to do it on items that, you know, not a particular pattern. Right? So it's like a, a Boolean array um, or whatever. So there, there's other kinds of masking that we can use as well. So you can also give, um, arrays of indexes to only pull off the items at particular positions and, and, and do the calculations on items. So, so you can give arrays of integers or arrays of booleans like this, a boolean mask. So, um, so if you still didn't quite understand what was going on uh, with this here, um, you know, you might want to go back and review that. We use that kind of passing in and, and, and selecting items based on a mask of some kind or based on an array of index values um, quite a bit. So that's part of slicing arrays and, and um, um, uh, indexing them and pulling out um, uh, values in different ranges. Uh, but yeah, I mean, in this case, right. So just real quickly, since our Boolean mask ended up looking like this, really only the, the values uh, in the three middle columns will get updated um, on this cell here where we do the, where we square. So basically all this is doing is selecting only those values in the middle three columns of Z and then squaring those values. So the result then is an array just of that shape, which is what, you know, the four column, four rows by three columns after we mask it out. So, so the mask gets, gets those four rows and three columns only, squares those, and the result is a four by three. And then we add in the, the four by three in the middle for C, although all the values in C are the same here, but, but we add in th that, you know, so it's important that you have the mask um, um, on C as well. So we have the same shape, so when you do the addition, um, um, uh, that that this will work here to, to correctly um, brought, have the same number of items that we can add together. So the square of these items in Z plus uh, these 
items of that shape out of C, add those together. And then the result, again, uh, this also works for assignment, which, you know, people can be surprised about if they do that and get used to that. So in this case, um, um, we're only assigning into those items specified by the mask, you know. So, so since our uh, result is a four row by three comms, and the, the, the thing we're assigning into is masked out to be four by three. Um, it will just assign into those particular values. Um, and then. <laughs> For part three, um, so of course it, it would help to you know to, to really understand what was going on um, in the previous one to, to get this one right. So you know the, the hard things on this is that um, I mean you did have to uh, instead of doing the, the hard coded shape, you had to, to transform it so that you know you initialize the C M and T to the shape of whatever Z is. It comes in. So, you know, um, we'll, we'll need to create temporary variables to, to solve things and do calculations, but their shape is going to be based on like our input data that comes in. So, so Z is kind of like our, our initial input data, um, but yeah, it's, it's shape is all our calculations kind of need to be of that same shape. So. Um, And then I mean, if uh, you know, um, I, I can't remember. I had a link. This these this Julia sets are an example of a type of fractal calculation. Not really important for this class. Uh, just makes pretty pictures. But 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 uh, if you've ever heard of fractals, this is an example of of creating um, a, a fractal here, doing this com this calculation in. Um, so Z is really an array of complex values. We're doing calculations in complex. Uh, um, in, in, in complex numbers here. So, um, so it, it doesn't make a difference. I mean, you do need to have this copy here. Um, as some people found out, um, although your, your calculation will work correctly, but um, um, uh, if you don't do a copy here, it'll actually mod, you, you know, you just, if, if you just modify the, the Z that's passed in, any modifications you make to Z, uh, will be still there after you call your function, which may or may not be what you want. So um, in this case, this is kind of a subtle point. I mean, you know, yeah, you have to know that, that things are passed in, can be passed, are normally passed in by value. So that means like a copy is made. But for efficiency reasons, arrays are usually passed around by reference. Um, so, so you, so, uh, um, NumPy arrays that it, it tries to avoid doing um, very what can be very expensive copying the stuff, including like when you pass into a function like this. So, so uh, by default, it passes in arrays by uh, by reference. So really, just um, um, a pointer to the same thing. So if you make modifications into it, um, those modifications will persist after you return them to the function. Um, which can be problematic if, if you uh, really want the function to, to return some result, but leave the data as kind of input. So, so yeah, sometimes you do have to ex explicitly make a copy uh, if you want to keep uh, things from being changed here. So, um, All right, so you know, and don't worry too much if if uh, you didn't quite get everything. Um, um, yeah, you know, if you're not quite getting all the details yet, you know. So, so I don't expect everybody to, to to completely be comfortable with all these things. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're kind of throwing you in here to. Um, you know, there's a lot of new stuff here, you know, especially. Uh, we're doing all the vectorized 
and the calculation using arrays and things here. But but um, if you go back and look kind of what you did here for the third problem, um, you know, so there is a loop in here, but the vast majority of the stuff that's being updated here, you know, we're using this, um, uh, you know, we're using NumPy arrays and, and, and we're using vectorized operations, you know, like, like I talked about in our um, um, videos for the previous week, right? So in, in, in languages that don't support operations like this, you would have to be writing lots of loops here. You know, it's, um, you know since, since Z, since all these arrays are two-dimensional, you most likely have to have uh, a nested loop that, that loops over the, the rows um, on the outer loop and over the columns on the inner loop. Uh, and you'd be doing that for every one of these calculations. So a nested loop to calculate the squares, like you could probably combine some of these, but um, you know, things like that, right? Um, and not to mention then, you know, this concept of, of like masking um, is, is, is very powerful. So, so it allows you to write very um, uh, small code to do powerful things. And, and that would be, uh, uh, would require a lot of um, detail work in a language like C, you know, um, or, or Java that doesn't support these kinds of vectorized operations. All right. Um, I don't know if anybody's, you know, if that's being useful for anybody or, um, and, and, you know, if, if, if you guys have questions, just uh, type them out or shout them out. Um, but yeah, if you got that right, you should have been able to reproduce that picture. Um, by the way, I mean, you know, you can, you can try changing like a, different initial values of C and stuff. If you're interested, you, you can generate different uh, fractals there, um, like, like you're using different con a different constant or things like that. Um, Um, oh, uh, yeah, so uh, one thing here, uh, so moving on to problem four here. Um, um, a few people uh, had like a hard-coded path here uh, when they tried to read in the data file. So you shouldn't do that, um, you know, so, so you shouldn't have something like uh, C colon backslash users, my name, whatever, right? So, so always use relative paths here. Um, so, I mean, this, you know, I've come to realize that, that not everybody um, um, kind of understands the file system and, and, and how to locate files uh, on a computing file system, um, at least not the, the way that I would have thought that, that people would, would, would understand that. And that's, that's kind of understandable because a lot of that stuff is kind of hidden from you nowadays. So you know, when you use a phone or even when you're using um, your laptop um, um, operating system, Mac OS or, or Windows um, um, or Linux, um, it, it does some things to, 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 to kind of hide some of the details of how the file systems work, right? But, but, but I am kind of expecting that, 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 that you're, you can at least learn this if, if you're not familiar with that. So, you know, um, when, when we're in our Jupyter Hub notebooks, um, we're in a repository directory. And, and, you know, when you're running JupyterHub, it is also hiding this a little bit from you um, as well. You know, so this is really a view into the, the file system for the, for, um, the account that you're running on, uh, that, that JupyterHub is running on. I mean, um, you can open up a terminal on here. Oh, um, oh, that was one thing I skipped over. I need to come back to that. But um, um, you can open up a terminal uh, to get to the actual um, Linux environment uh, that your JupyterHub server is running on. So, so you know, if you open up a, a launcher, um, you can open up different things besides Python notebooks, like a terminal and, and other kinds of editors and things. Um, 
And um, you know, this is a command line environment. So, uh, but but you can you can kind of view um, the file system from here. So you know, all file systems um, start from some root location. So on Windows C drive, on Linux, and on Mac OS, it's it's the slash which is the root directory, and then it, it's all hierarchical. So so file systems are all really hierarchical uh, for for all kind of major operating systems that most people are um, familiar with. So that, that means that in a directory, there can be many subdirectories, and then those subdirectories can have further subdirectories and so on. So, so you know, if, if you're not familiar with that, you know, I, I, I do kind of expect people should be able to navigate their way through the file system and understand um, the idea that, you know, I'm at a particular place in the file system. So when you open up um, a notebook, like the assignment one Python notebook. So the assignment one Python, um, or the assignment one notebook is in the ML Python class, which is in the assignment subdirectory. Uh, and then the file name is, is assignment one Python NumPy exercise. Okay, so that's kind of your path here, right? That's not the full path because, it, uh, because again, it, it's hiding a little bit for you. So it kind of gives you the root of a particular directory um, in Jupyter Hub here. Um, so the full path is, you know, again, you'd have to go down uh, and look in your operating system, but, um, you know, so if you look on here, there's a directory called ML Python class, and, and that is really the same as the repository directory that you get a git clone on. So uh, this is actually being shared, this directory, the ML Python class, should be being shared uh, and mounted between your host system and your dev box okay but but anyway so so that is the root of what you see on the file browser on uh jupyter hub here um, so in particular i could go into the ml python class and go into assignments um, and then here we'll, we would see all of our uh, these same assignments here right um but um, so back to this though. So so you should never be hard coding in like an absolute path uh, because then when I run the notebook, um, um, that absolute path will probably not be correct anymore, especially if you hard coded in like your username or something like that. So you should, you should always be doing things relative. To, so so your current directory is in the assignments, um, and and. Um, All of the data files are up one directory. So two dots by convention means the parent of the current directory. Um, in many um, operating systems, so, so so two dots means go up from my current directory. My current directory is here in the assignment. So if I go up one, I'm now back into the the, the root of our repository directory, the ML Python class, and then from there navigate to data directory. Um, and then from there, find a file named assignment one data.csv. You know? So, anyway, yeah, I mean, you know, I understand and, and people maybe have not thought about that before or things like that, but, but um, 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 you ought to kind of try and become comfortable with that concept. And, and, and yeah, when, when people tell you things like, don't give me an absolute directory or an absolute path name, have it relative to the current location. You ought to kind of know what people mean by that and what the idea of, of my current directory is and how to specify things relative to my current directory to find things. So, so this is very common um, in, in, uh, in projects and repositories. I mean, this is how you organize projects like this. So, um, uh, so here for our ML Python, class repository, everything is in that repository. And you know, whenever we need data from, from the data directory, we, we will use relative path names to go to data. Whenever we need to run scripts from the scripts directory, we would specify them relative to the scripts um, directory, which is off of the top level directory um, and so on. Right. So that, that's, that's kind of important then for these kinds of projects. Uh, because you'll normally store your data files um, in one directory, like a data subdirectory, and then pull all your data files from there to do your analysis of them and, 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 uh, and processing of them. So, okay. 
Um, so besides that, I don't know if I had any thing to point out. I mean, most everybody um, had basically gotten all the things on there, except for um, a few people um, were hard coding in or weren't doing the path quite right. So, um, I guess not everybody did the uh, the the last thing that I kind of said is extra credit, but um, uh, there's an example of that in the um, solution. So, I mean, there's lots of ways that you could sort this the way I uh, discussed there. So, uh, or, or um, um, asked for there. Um, So yeah, I mean, in this example, um, we're basically just extracting out the data that we want to, to sort uh, first. I'm doing a couple of steps um, on this last one. Um, but, but yeah, so, so data frame, so this creates a new data frame or a view into the data frame. And then one of the methods that you can call on data frames is sort values. And then you can specify, I think you can even specify like uh, more than one column, you know, sort by that column first, and if, the, if, there's, if there's equal values in the first column, it'll go to the second column to do secondary sorting. So it's pretty sophisticated to do the sort values. And, uh, but but the other one, so the, I don't know, I, I don't use these uh, convenient. So also pandas data frames uh, have lots of, you know, they have plot and histogram and lots of kind of basic plots. Um, um, I, I guess, yeah, for kind of real quick, um, data visualizations um, that can be useful. So. Uh, okay. So any questions? I mean, I think, oh, there was one more thing um, before I forget about it. Yeah, if anybody is, wants to ask kind of a specific question about the actual the the actual work, um, please do. Um, um, so I just posted an announcement today. I just found out that um, um, for some reason. Um, one of the libraries is, wasn't being installed in. Um, In our dev box, so somehow it got left out. Um, so if you didn't see this announcement yet, let me show you how to do that. Um, so, so like I was saying, you do have to. Uh, it'll be fast if, if you are using the, the class dev box. It'll be fastest if you just do it yourself um, to get this missing library. So this one, um, the 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 second video from this week. Was using Scikit-Learn, and, and the, the notebook wouldn't work until you get Scikit-Learn installed. So, um, so again, I'll show you how to do that. Um, so, if you open up a, a terminal, so I think that the, I think you basically just have to open up a launcher first in order to get a terminal. I don't know if there's a direct keyboard shortcut or something to open up a terminal, but. Um, but anyway, so just get a terminal open, uh, and, and you know this is a rate. I mean, this is you know your virtual box is running Linux, so it's running a Ubuntu twenty one version of Linux, so Ubuntu twenty. I can't remember. Um, um, so so, so it's a full blown Linux inside of your virtual box. Um, so the and and by default we just use a, a user called Vagrant. So we're actually logged in um, as a regular user of Vagrant. Another thing. You know, and learning a little bit of, of, of how to do stuff on a line command line is a good skill to pick up. So, um, I, I don't, we won't have a lot of opportunity in this class to, to do things on this unless there's problems with the dev box. But, um, um, so, so anyway, so you're logged in as, as a normal user, uh, but we need to install some stuff. So, uh, we need to change over to the root user. The, the vagrant user has super user privileges, so you can change login as the root user by doing the sudo-s. 
So if you do that, notice after I log in with the SUDO-S, um, um, I'm now the root user. Now from there, we can do uh, things like installing software um, for the whole system. So in particular, you need to do a, um, um, we're using the Conda package manager to install Python and to manage Python and all of the scientific Python libraries. Um, and uh, Python allows you to um, create what are known as um, um, environments. And, and those, those kernels are, are basically implemented as environments um, uh, in here. So I can, I can have as many environments as I want. Uh, and each environment is, is a separate entity that I can install a different set, you know, so I can even put like Python version two in the environment um, and, and then switch over to that if I need to do some work with Python two, um, or I can have a Python three environment, uh, I can have a Python three environment that only, that, that has like TensorFlow and maybe CUDA, so I can try and do stuff with my, um, my GPU card, no. So that, that's how they're often used is, is like, if I need one particular package for some work I'm doing on, and I don't want that in available for everything, I might make an environment just to work on that particular project that needs uh, a particular specialized software or something. Um, so once you activate your environment, um, you'll see your prompt changes to kind of remind you uh, which, um, um, on the environment you're at. And then from there, you can do the uh, and, uh, install of packages. So you don't have to put in the dash yes if you don't want to, that, that'll just answer the prompt. But um, um, the, the name of the package that was missing was scikit-learn, I think. So hopefully I got it right on the, on the announcement there. So it's already installed on mine, so it'll probably just tell me. Was that, that right? right. Um, so it'll probably just tell me that it's already installed here. But but you know if you do that, it'll do that. If, if you don't have the dash dash yes, it'll ask you, do you want to install yes or no? Um, if you don't have it installed, so. yeah. And you know, um, I mean, I, I guess it could be that there's some other stuff missing. Uh, there, I, I was supposed to have everything uh, installed as part of installing the dev box, so. So you probably won't have to do that again, but but I guess it could be possible. Um, but it was a good anyway to kind of understand. It. That's kind of some of the details. So so even if you're setting up your own environment, your own Python um, using like Conda, I mean, you can do the same things even if you're not using a virtual box. So, so if you're using uh, the, the Conda Python distribution, you can create environments like this and, and um, install packages into separate environments and, and things like that. So. Um, yes so the the question was in case you can't hear too much is, is uh, i mean you're asking like, could you exactly recreate this environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can, um, and if, if you wanted to, I mean, I can give you the versions that we, uh, of the things that we installed here, if you wanted to try and install it. And then that might be another, if, if other people are using your own Conda install, you might want to ask me, in, in fact, uh, you know, what the versions are of the software. Um, so that would make it more likely that you get, um, exactly the, the versions of the different things but 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 yeah the answer to the question is is you could create an environment and you could install the particular versions of the things in exactly the same libraries like we have set up here so yes yeah. like, like, I mean, uh, right so and i don't have it on my own system but i don't want to pay Oh, um, well, um, 
I mean, you, you'd have to, if, if you're using cloud computing resources, you'd have to pay for a, a machine instance that has a GPU. But yeah, if you, if you have that, you should be able to install the GPU versions of TensorFlow. So there's like a TensorFlow based GPU. And you also have to, have to install like a CUDA, the CDA. Uh, in like a, a virtual machine, but yeah, it should should work um, on a cloud computer. Yeah. All right. Um, other questions? How many people we got here still? I have quite a few. Okay. Um, so let me know. So uh, I usually, uh, although we had a little bit of a late start, sorry to get about that again. I have to check my IT environment here before we do this next time. Um, but um, I usually, you know, kind of go for about an hour and then take a five minute break. Um, so why don't we take five minutes and then I'm probably going to come back and talk about um, the materials this week um, for things. All right. So I'm going to pause the recording here for five minutes. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start back up again. Um, oh, lost some people. Um, okay. So yeah, my intention was um, probably just another hour here, um, although that will be already almost seven. Um, but I thought I would go over the assignments. Um, this week's uh, lecture materials. Um, so there are videos on these, and, and uh, actually. Um, let me just mention something about the video. So, you know, um, I know people aren't, not everybody's through all of these yet, or, or maybe even just getting started on the first one or so. There are like actually four videos uh, called unit three, one, two, three, and four. These are all from chapter two of our hands-on machine learning uh, textbook. Um, I, uh, Am I sharing my screen? Um, anybody that's online here, let me check. Um, I'm probably not sharing my screen, all right. <laughs> yep, yep, sorry about that. So uh, let me get my screen shared again. There we go. Um, All right, so as I was saying, so just a word about, there's quite a bit of, of um, uh, lecture videos and, and material. So not only are there, the, there are actually four videos, uh, uh, one through uh, four. Uh, one through three basically go through chapter two of the hands-on machine learning, our textbook. So, you know, you can read the textbook and uh, do videos all along. You know, it'd be good to have, I mean, I, I think most people really need to have the textbook as well for this class. To fill in the details, um, you might not get everything from just going to my lecture notebooks um, and, uh, and and lecture videos. Um, so you know, try to do this, but but yeah, and the, the, these lecture videos are pretty closely following uh, the materials that, that he had in the um, uh, the chapter two on these topics. So, so this week we're kind of really just getting into. Uh, an introduction to the, the topic of machine learning. And we're talking a little bit about some stuff that this course really isn't primarily about. Uh, but, but for real data scientists, uh, uh, actually building and testing machine learning models tends to be um, not that not as big a part of the job. You don't spend as much time on that as you might think. So, so, so most people that are that are data, data scientists or um, data analysts tend to spend like 50, 60, 70 percent of the time really doing kind of data exploration and data cleaning and data mining and maybe stuff on the other on the back end. So, so actually building production systems and, and making certain that the data is flowing in and predictions are working and that kind of stuff. So, so from you know, I haven't done this uh, as as a as a paid data analyst for a while, but uh, most people tell you that. So, so, you know, a lot of your time is really spent on on, on these. So, so it's important to, uh, although we we focus on kind of you know the machine learning and building models and stuff, but uh, but but don't underestimate kind of the importance of some of the topics that, that we start with here um, on chapter two. 
Um, but yeah, you should probably watch the first three videos and um, um, first, of course, and, and read the chapter two. Now, I've got a bunch of other videos actually, but, but these um, you can um, use uh, to kind of fill in then uh, on the coming weeks. Okay? So the fourth video um, is kind of a bit of an overview of Psych and Learn, um, but um, uh, you don't necessarily have to get to that one this week, um, although uh, this information will be useful for assignment two, um, which I have a due date of next week on that. Um, so sometimes between that and when you're getting ready to start for assignment two, then you might want to get into the, the fourth video. Uh, there's also some, some other videos on there, some reviews of concepts of calculus, um, probability statistics, um, uh, probability and statistics. So um, those, um, you know, uh, we won't be needing for a little while, and, and of course, depending on your background and whether you know how solid you are, kind of on, on calculus. Um, and uh, if you've ever taken a statistics course or a probability course, uh, you may or may not need to do a, a lot with those. But those are there, and there's also some other links to some things. And probably another one. Oh, I, I think. Um, uh, in a week or two, also, I got a video on linear algebra um, and things like that. That's another kind of good one. But again, I don't expect you to take a course in that, but um, it might be good to do some things if you've never done, uh, you know, never studied probability or statistics or linear algebra. Or And, and I, I do expect everybody to probably at least take the calculus at some point um, in your undergraduate, but it might have been a while. So, so, you know, if it's been a while, you might want to review that um, at some point, but but um, uh, you got a little bit of time. Um, in, in a couple of weeks, we'll start getting into some stuff um, where um, I hope, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not essential to this course that you get the, the, the deeper uh, things that we'll go into. So we'll go into a little bit of some of the background, um, uh, the, the, the equations that underlie uh, some of the, the, the machine learning methods and, and things that we do. So, um, um, and, and you can still be fine on this course, um, even if you don't get all those details, uh, but we will present them a little bit in this course and try and, uh, for, the people, for those that are interested, um, try and get you started on being able to understand the concepts and how these work at a deeper level. So, and that, that will be where it would be helpful to kind of review calculus if it's been a while for you um, and linear algebra. So. Um, all right. So let me do these one by one. Um, oh, so those are all in the, uh, the, I've got a couple of subdirectories under lectures, um, if you were confused by these. So um, our first two or three weeks here are under the HOML. Um, I've got, I've got to add some. Um, um, I don't quite have everything in here yet. Um, but, um, but yeah, actually for the next uh, for first half of the course anyway, um, most of our uh, video lectures, uh, the, the, the notebooks that I used on the video lectures are, are in this HOML directory. Um, so. Oh, and, and um, I mean, you know, I mentioned it on the course. Um, there's a, a, another course that I used to use in this, in this class uh, with Dr. Ng, spelled Ng. It's a really good course. Um, so I mean, if you're looking for some alternative um, um, viewpoints uh, on these, um, uh, you might want to check out his videos as well. And I've also got kind of these lecture notebooks from a previous sort of version of this course where I was kind of directly using his lecture notebooks. So that's another resource. So you know, if, if if you you know if you go through my presentation of like linear regression when we get there in another week or two. Um, and uh, uh, you need some more, you might want to check out his videos and the lecture notes for that on there as well. So those, are, those are available. Um, yeah, we're pretty much like done with um, all the stuff on the Python stack, or, you know, I, I know people are probably still reviewing those, but. Um, All right.
So yeah, chapter three of our hands-on machine learning um, is uh, kind of some big, big picture stuff. Uh, kind of, and he starts with um, um, data exploration and, and um, um, you know, um, loading data and cleaning data. So I'll we'll talk about those briefly. Um, so there's this kind of example again, directly taken from chapter two of our textbook here. Uh, and then kind of the last third or last half of chapter two, uh, we get into uh, we start talking about uh, actually training machine learning models. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so we don't expect you yet to, to um, know how they work, but but uh, but uh, give an example of, of what we mean by using a data set to train a model um, and um, evaluate it. So, um, so, you know, as I go through that, I mean, I spent quite a lot of time on the lecture videos, so, so I might go through, uh, skip over, skip around on this stuff, but uh, those of you that are online or, or here, um, you know, if you have questions about stuff, um, uh, let me know. So, so I'd, uh, um, um, you know, I'd, I'd probably not everybody's gotten through all these videos yet. I uh, hope that you've at least kind of started um, on the first one or two here um, at this point. Um, um, sure. Um, so for for scikit learn, I, I think that was in the the second one, right? Um, handling text and categorical attributes. Um, so um, for for the, the question was about this uh, one hot encoding and categorical attributes. And I'll probably come back to this, but um, since, since somebody um, is asking about it, um, so yeah, in this particular case, um, when you when we read in the data file from the chapter two. Uh, they, they come in as strings and the strings look like this, you know, so less than one H ocean, near ocean, so on. So, so yeah, exactly like you said, I mean, you could force, if, if you have like integer numbers and you want to do a one half encoding, you could force them to string. Um, although to tell the truth, I don't think that's necessary. So I, I think that uh, the one half encoding, scikit-learn, um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, like the ordinal encoder would probably work fine if you give it like a, a column of integers as well. It'll probably, it'll, it'll probably do it about one hundred just fine with integers. So I, I, you know, and so. how do you add this as a feature, like in your? Oh, it's not the, not ordinal, the, where's the one hundred encoding? But um, you know, it's not. Um, yeah, it's not ordinal. Yeah, one hundred encoding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we could, we could, uh, uh, just say, yeah, I didn't, um, uh, ask your, you can ask your question again, but um, um, we could maybe. Again, let's see if we can bring up the contextual help here. So I might have to rerun my notebook, but um, um, you know, so, so this kind of stuff, you know, you can go, you, you can find the scikit-learn um, documentation and go look up the one hot encoder, um, or sometimes you can get enough information just from JupyterHub by using the contextual help. Um, yeah, so we had it here. So. Um, um, so it should be an array like of integers or strings. So, so yeah, it sounds like integers will work fine um, as your input to that, so, which is what I would guess would, would be the case. Um, what, were your, what were the other questions? Um, so you created a class function class, and then you had like um, the Um, yeah, so, um, um, so it was combined attributes out of 
Um, right, right. So I'm, I'm jumping down to that. So again, I, I think um, the question is about in, in two. So uh, in the second one, when we're doing data cleaning, we were looking at um, um, using the scikit-learn, what are known as pipelines for doing these transformations. It was a very powerful thing. Um, and, and again, I think you'll get some practice using these. So, um, but they're becoming pretty standard um, for scikit-learn and other libraries are kind of beginning to pick up this model. Um, so, so of having a transformation pipeline where, where, where the input becomes the output, the next step in the pipeline and so on. So, uh, but but um, um, yeah, so, so I think the example uh, in, in the notebook does what you were, you were talking about. So um, there's a... Um, Then we, well, I so said the very final one uh, at the end was an example of a full pipeline where we um, um, where we do the numerical. Um, so, so, so this is this is a relatively uh, new thing in scikit-learn, although it must be a year old by now because uh, I had this in here the previous year. But um, um, but but yeah, you, you used to, you used to kind of have to do. The uh, pipeline for numerical attributes, and then a, a pipeline for categorical in parallel, and you had to kind of combine them yourself. So yeah, they did add this new one, um, this column transformer, um, where you can actually make your two separate pipelines and then have one um, um, uh, pipeline um, that combines um, to do them at the same time. And so yeah, that, that last one should be in the depth. So it's good in the creating a one half thing. Uh, that categorical attribute, and and you'll end up with um, yeah, you end up with sixteen total attributes, where you start with only eight, and, and part of the reason why that expands is because the one column for the category becomes uh, four or five, uh, uh, one for each of those categorical attributes there. And then you can actually use the same pipeline in order to uh, basically train your model, right? So you have to take SCM uh, and then you can train your model. Yes. Yes. So. So then, I just want to like. So if you actually use this as you know to transform your column, these are your features. And if you want to add these features to your model, how do you add this pipe pipeline to your model? Um. So. Um. So, so, so the general one. So you said, so you said you hadn't gotten to the third one yet. So the general idea is that you create a um, a machine learning um, um, uh, what do you call it a um, a model basically, and and you just add it as the last step on the pipeline. Um, so the, all the fit transform stuff will come into it. So for example. Um, uh, so again, we'll jump right to that. So, so in the third video, we show training a couple models, including, um, I'm going to rerun all these. Oh, uh, the, I have a little bit, of, have a little bit of trouble running this notebook because uh, some of these take some time to do here. So we probably don't want to do all of them, um, but, um, See here. I mean, just real quickly for uh, an answer to your question. Um, yeah. Uh, so I mean, you can do it kind of by hand. Um, so so here, yeah, all we're doing is uh, we we first use the pipeline to create the housing prepared, and then we just pass that in to the um, the. Um, um, uh, uh, our, our decision tree regressor in this case, um, uh, and, and call the fit function on it. Uh, you know, basically, fit is turning the model in this case, um, or the, um, the, the, and that has to prepare is the, the same data. So that has the one half coding and all the other information to this. It's basically turning the model on that um, data that's been scaled um, and had the categorical transformations and things like that. But um, Um, oh, uh, here's an example of using uh, cross-validation scoring. Um, 
for the housing preparer and so uh, and, and, but um but, but yeah so it, it, it can be as simple as that and and um, oh I, I know what I'm, I'm thinking of so uh, so you can even get more complicated so um um Well, so, um, uh, and we can come back to this. So like for, for we can set up this grid search, um, but again, also we're doing is, is uh, we're using the, uh, uh, the data that we created with that pipeline, passing that in for this uh, fit method for the, um, the grid search here. So one quite, that one quite what I was thinking of, but, but um, I, I think the answer, I think. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of um, or our fit method um, as, as one simple example um, for a you know a model, whatever model we want to use, regressor, linear regression, or forest, or random forest, or whatever. All right. Um, mm -hmm. Second time, or? yes, the second time. Yeah. The first part. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to remember. Um, but um, yeah. So um, yeah, I, I did. Um, so I just want to know if I actually had like I'll go this. Next one. So So it's recognized on the count. You pull it out. You pull it out, I guess, uh, right now, I think you got one more. Oh, okay. You pull it out, when you pull it out, like a single one, you actually got a like, series. So, yeah, so. That 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 comes out of the ice. That, that seems like something that I would like to work with. It's expecting like a road or a two-dimensional like stuff, but it's expecting it to be a remember road by one column instead of just one dimensional. Like, um, yeah, you, you said the Western State Gas and um, uh just Right. So that means it's a bunch of one dimensional. 
And, and yeah, that's just basically it doesn't have to be two dimensional for uh, type of work. So, I mean, the, the one minus one is short term for um, for it's like the work we're reviewing is two dimensional where you know, we have all the rows of each one. But I think I want to the house that under the company that they didn't need to be. Yeah, it did, but then when you hold it out, if you would hold out like multiple columns, you would have done another three blocks, four columns, but that was a much better. Mm -hmm. That would be like the other thing. Yeah, so yeah, I think you just Yeah. Um, all right. Let's continue on. Um, so I'm going to go back to the assignment one uh, and just discuss things. Um, and you know, if, if people have other questions, just chat them out. While we're talking about things here. Um, so there was kind of a lot of, um, yeah, like, like, you know, big picture things uh, that, that maybe I could mention here um, that are good to know. So for example, um, the vast majority of when you're doing data analytics or doing machine learning like this, I mean, you're almost always going to be doing stuff. It comes down to doing a simple table. So, so even if you're using really big, data, um, at some point you're going to want to format it into a, a two-dimensional table. So you have rows and columns, okay? And it's pretty much become convention that um, the rows should represent the samples in the data. So each row um, is one set of values that are all related, so, so that they're from one sample. So like for our housing data that we just loaded here, um, um, it has, you know, it has 20, 1,640 rows, which are our samples. So each each one of those represents uh, a district in this um, data set. We're using as an example here, uh, and then the columns are going to be features. Okay, so in this case, and again for one particular row, these are all the features of the the sampled um, district uh, in in this California housing data that we gather. Right. So, so for the particular district um, that was in row five, so, so the fifth, actually the sixth district, since we index starting at zero here always for our arrays uh, in Python. Um, so uh, the, this one at index five, you know, had a la long, longitude latitude. That is that's its location in California on the Earth at that particular longitude and latitude, and um, this was the median age of the houses. So th there was a total of 193 houses in this district, um, and they were um, on. And so median is different from the mean, slightly different, right? So I mean, there's a similar idea. If you don't know what a median is, you might want to do the review on statistics um, video or look that up. Um, so it had a median age of 52 of all these 193 houses, and so on, right? So those are just the features, right? uh, and those will come out as columns. Um, um, we see a view of, of this. I just haven't run these here. So, um, yeah, and, and you know, so I won't go through all the details of this. So, there's some examples of, of pulling out some slices, you know, using the pandas uh, data frame or using uh, NumPy arrays. So. Um, you know, so, like, if you want to just pass, if you just want to pull out, if you have a data frame and you just want to pull out one feature, you can just specify that feature by name um, uh, to pull it out. So yeah, in, in particular, so this is common. So when, when we read in our data from, we're using uh, CSV a lot for our, our, our data here. Where do we read that in? Well, I guess I don't actually read it in until down here. So 
so the, the load housing data. So, I mean, as you saw on the, the first assignment, um, CSV is, is a very simple format. The, the plain text format, so, so separated by commas, so CSV is comma separated values, right? So, yeah, if, if we were using more bigger data, we might want we might need something a little bit more sophisticated. So we might want an actual database and do SQL queries to pull it out, or um, there's other formats for big data that, that people use. But but the result is is usually pretty much the same. So however we we're storing it down at the back end. Uh, we can pull it into something that we rep that basically is table like, so rows and columns, where the rows are the um, the samples of the data and the columns are the features. Do we want to manipulate? Um, Uh, the first part here is just all examples of, again, of, of accessing the data frame in this case to get information about it and to get um, particular things. And oh, and, and uh, I started saying, so um, um, as is typical for the data in this class, usually we will store both the uh, input features, but also one of the columns if we're doing um, um, classification or regression, like we're doing in this case, one of the columns will actually be the target uh, that we want to train our model to try and predict, right? So in this case, uh, the column called um, uh, the median house value is what we're ultimately trying to build a predictor for. So um, the, 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 the thing that we're trying to do is if we're given a district um, that we haven't seen before, but we're told uh, what its location is and, and what the, uh, the what the median income is for the, the, the people in that district and um, um, you know, the, the total rooms and total bedrooms. If we're given those information, we want, want to predict, okay, so how expensive are houses? Uh, you know, can we make a prediction of the mean house value is going to be for that district? And that's, that's the, the model that we're trying to build here. Um, Um, so let me, let me go through, I won't, I won't kind of make comments about these things. So there's some examples, again, of, kind of da basic data exploration. So, you know, be able to pull out, look at, at the values. And so some basic things you want to ask always begin when, when you're beginning with a number of data set is, you know, so how many rows do I have? So how many samples do I have? How many features do I have? And then once you know that, you know, what are the features? What are the types of the features? You know, so you can ask for like info if you have a data, if you have a pandas data frame, you get some basic idea of what columns you have or what features you have and what their types are. So, you know, usually your data is going to be a lot messier than this. Um, when you get it. So you have lots of different types and might have some floats and some integers and you have, might have lots of things that are in there is kind of just general string data that you're going to have to do some um, some parsing of to do to, to extract the information from it so um, things that are kind of string like show up as object data type uh, in pandas data frame so when you see that often it's it's something that's encoded as a string in, in the data in the file that you have Um, when you use describe on a data frame, it only um, will just it only it calculates a bunch of um, basic statistics, but it can only do that on the numerical features. So only the things that were like floats or hints uh, can you get this kind of breakdown. But and and the breakdown is really very basic. So again, it just shows you the the mean and the standard deviation um, and kind of also the percentiles. So, so the min value, the max value and the 25th, 50th and 75th percentile. So, although uh, I should point out, so an important thing, uh, so we'll later on talk about, or, or when you work through the, the, the lecture notebooks, we talk about data cleaning. So an important thing is this count to understand. So, so this will give an indication whether any data is missing or not for these numerical attributes. Um, in this case, we know that we had 
20,640 rows. So we can see all of these features um, uh, since the counts are 20,640, um, they must not have any missing data for any of those except one. So one of the features um, had a count that was slightly below the, the number of rows that we actually have in the, the database, and that was the total better. So that's an indication that some of those, um, the, those data in, in that particular feature, uh, total bedrooms, were missing. You know? so, so not too many, um, just, uh, what, just a little bit over 200. Again, this is pretty clean data. So typically you'll have lots of, of columns or lots of features that are missing data. You know, some columns may be only missing a few. Some columns might be missing 10% of the data, 25% of the data. You know, at some point, I, I talk about this here. So at some point, you know, if, if you're missing too much um, data for a feature, um, the feature isn't going to be useful because you're not going to be able to um, fill in that missing data with any accuracy. Right? So, so once you get above you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of the data missing, questionable whether you can really use that feature or not, unless you go back and, and fill those in. So, so regather that data for that missing feature. Right? Um, so, and we've only got one example of a categorical, um, this. Uh, ocean proximity, but it doesn't seem to have any missing. So, so for categorical data, we have to do something slightly different, like, you know, um, sum up the, the value counts. Um, first example of kind of a visualization. So it's important, again, it would be helpful if you took the course of statistics and know what we mean by the general distribution of the data, right? So, so histograms give you a rough idea of the distribution of each one of these features here. So, so um, again, um, you had to do this for assignment one already, but um, you can use summary um, visualizations uh, on pandas data frames like histogram, like hist, to, to, to generate histograms. And, and the default behavior is to generate a histogram for uh, an individual histogram for each column, right? And we've only got nine, uh, or actually we've only got, um, um, yeah, that's right. So, so we've got nine numerical features and then a 10th categorical feature. So it, it, again, it's only gonna generate a histogram of the, the numerical features that you have. But, but yeah, this gives you an idea of, uh, again, a visualization of the min and max range of your data and, you know, whether it's kind of more normal and smooth, you know, or whether it's, it's you know, like, like you know, some of those data is kind of bimodal here. So, in fact, I don't think I talked about it in the, um, um, in the lecture video, but uh, the, the latitude and longitude are basically bimodal because in California there's, Kind of two centers of population, um, you know, the, the Bay Area, um, San Francisco, Oakland area, and then the Los Angeles area. So that's kind of why you get bimodal, it's reflecting those two places where most of the, the population data is. Um, um, another thing I discussed here, though, that uh, something that visualizations can give you that it can be hard to see if you're just looking at tables and numbers. Um, uh, we do have some problems on this data because there's some clipping going on. Um, it looks like um, if the median age was over 50 um, for data, they just clipped it at 50. So they didn't in the median age over 50. Um, but another one, um, the median house value also was clipped at like 500,000. That one's more problematic because that's that's the data we're actually trying to predict, right? So that's going to be our um, dependent variable that we're trying to build a model of the, uh, the, the median house value. So not having uh, actual median house values above a certain level means that our model can't really predict things. You know, so it can only predict whether it's going to be five hundred thousand, and that might even interfere a bit with with making a good model. To, you know. Um, since lots of things ended up being kind of clipped right at that upper level here, median house values. So. Um, let's 
So in this section, we kind of show some more ideas of, of visualizing. So, so there's some general principles that we discuss in here, you know, so, so you want, you need to, to do manipulations in order to bring out the important stuff so you can understand that, right? So since we're trying to build a model of, um, of uh, the median house price, you know, we ultimately want to get to being able to figure out sort of what the distribution is of the, 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 the house values, the median house values um, in the, the location of our data set. Um, well, thus, that's kind of why we're adding in some visual uh, representations of not only the location, but of the population size. So, so we use the size of the markers to, to indicate whether that district has a big number of houses or a small number of households in it. So, so that, that's just by the, the size of the marker. And then we use color then to be able to see what the differences, you know, where the, the high price and low price houses are. Right? Because as, as you can see here, I mean, just, just from this, I mean, we, we probably want to keep latitude and longitude um, in our data because the, the high priced houses are clustered, you know, in particular locations in the California data. Right? So, not to mention also they're, they're near the ocean. So, so we would expect the categorical variable of being um, um, on the ocean or, um, so also help us detect the ones that are on the high range or predict the ones that are, you know, have high house values. Um, now, the, so the final thing in this, in this first um, notebook, was talking a little bit about looking for correlations in the data. So uh, I mean, this is kind of important. Um, um, you know, so whether a feature, you know, a column is going to be useful or not. Um, 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 one indication of that is how correlated it is to the thing you're trying to predict, right? So as, as a first approximation, if you just run a, a simple correlation, which is a, a concept from statistics uh, between each feature um, and the, uh, the, 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 the value that you're gonna be using as your label or, or your predictor, um, this might give you some sense about which things might be useful and which things won't be, might not be as useful. Um, for a model, right? So sometimes when you have large numbers of features, you, you might use a, um, you know, a correlation like this and you might do a threshold. You might throw away things that aren't very highly correlated with the um, uh, thing you're trying to predict um, uh, just in order to reduce the size of, of your data set, reduce the number of things you have that you're using as inputs to your model. So, Although here, you know, you have to know a little bit about how correlations work because uh, things can be negatively correlated. So, so whether it has a high positive correlation or high negative correlation, as long as it's big, as long as the correlation is big, um, it might be useful. But it's the things that are close to zero that um, are less likely um, to be useful for building a model to predict things with. So, um, Yeah, and then you know this this is only a very brief idea about using about what's known as feature engineering. So sometimes you can build better features from existing features. Right? So, so you don't always have the luxury of going out and collecting the data that you would really like to collect. You know, you got the data, and that's all you got. You have to build the best model that you can with it. But sometimes you can take the existing features and build new features or extract new features from them that make the signal better in, in the noise of the data that you have, right? So um, the very end of this first notebook is a little example of that. So, you know, the, the data that we had was just the total number of um, like rooms um, 
in the whole district, right? And, and you know, that, that's kind of not a normal way that people would think about that. So you might, might be more useful, at least for people trying to make predictions of what, what is like the, the, the average number of rooms that we have per household in that district. Um, you know, or, or the average number of bedrooms that you have um, in, in the houses in that district. Right? So that, that would seem to make more sense. Right? But we can, we can extract those and add those as features to, to the data if we want to. Right? Uh, by the way, I, I asked this, but I didn't answer. Um, um, so if, if you calculate the bedrooms per room, um, um, which is, again, um, A, an extracted measure or a, an engineered feature, um, but but this this number here, you know, by dividing the total bedrooms in the district by the total rooms, we get kind of the ratio of the, the number of bedrooms to the room. So why why would that be negatively correlated? Um, and uh, it, it kind of makes sense um, that it would be negatively correlated because basically. Um, What that's saying is that um, um, if we have so, so normally for houses we, we probably like, even for houses that are really expensive you know we probably don't have more much more than three four bedrooms unless it's a really really big mansion right so but when you have expensive houses what what kind of happens is that um, uh, you know instead you know kind of the, the number of bedrooms uh, and bathrooms is well. It's kind of fixed, but but you start adding in a bunch of other extra rooms. So you know you add in um, a um, a fitness room and maybe a media room and, and a couple of offices and things like that, right? So kind of what this is saying is is probably um, is there's a negative correlation here uh, because um, Because you have more other kinds of rooms than bedrooms once you have a, a expensive houses, right? So, so um, it, it, when the bedrooms per room um, is smaller, um, that, that's more indicative of a more expensive house, right? Well, anyway, I, I think that's, that that makes sense to me of why there was a negative correlation. But but the the um, the thing to note here though is that uh, that feature seems to have that engineered feature has, has a pretty big um, magnitude. So it's negative, negative 0.25, right? So that might be something that's gonna be useful for building a model to predict house price, right? So uh, it's, it's the biggest magnitude besides the, the median income, right? So we think probably the median income of the people in the district um, is, is gonna be our best thing to be able to predict what the house price is, right? But but this bedrooms per room, um, along with some of these other things, um, might also be useful for our models here. Um, all right, so let me continue on to number two here. Um, So, you know, the first one was just about kind of exploring and understanding the data. So, in actually, to, to, to actually use the data uh, to build machine learning models with, we're, we're going to have to clean it, right? And, and this data that we had in this example for chapter two was relatively clean. So, I mean, real data, like, like if, if you go off um, and, and, and get real data that you want to build a model for, or if you go off and look at like data, I don't know, like on, um, um, Like, um, like on some of these competition sites, um, some people might be familiar with. Um, um, but in, in general, um, it'll, it'll tend to be a lot messier than this. So you'll have to spend a lot of time trying to prepare it and clean it before it's useful. So, I mean, usually you're gonna have lots of things like missing data. Um, you're gonna have to scale it um, um, before you use it. Um, so many machine learning, um, um, Algorithms are sensitive to having data that's on different scales. So we, the, the, those are the, some of the things that we introduce um, in this um, um, part of the 
the plot over here from our textbook. So, um, I don't know why when I run all the cells sometimes, and I think that's a bug in Jupyter Hub. So sometimes I've been seeing that I do a run all cells and, and it actually runs all the cells, but for some time it doesn't give me the output for all my cells there, which is kind of weird. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm just going to go speed up a little bit here just so I can finish up. Um, but yeah, I mean, if anybody thinks of any other questions, so far, let me know. Um, so, you know, one of the most troubling things um, is, is what to do about missing data, right? So, I mean, there's kind of three basic options. Um, you could just get rid of, of any sample, so get rid of any district in this data set that has a, a missing feature. So remember, there was only one column, the total bedrooms, and there's about 200 of those that were missing. So, so just getting rid of those 200 uh, districts uh, that didn't have the total bedrooms uh, wouldn't hurt us too much. So that would be an option here, right? Um, but you know, that's not always a good approach because um, it, it might be that. that um, you have a lot more, um, and you don't want to you don't want to throw away data if you don't have to. You know, the more data you have, the better usually. Right? So you want to keep as much data as you can. That's that's useful. Um, so the other option is you know if we, we could drop the whole attribute, the whole column that has data that's missing, right? and again you know. We, we generally don't want to do that unless we have reason to believe that that column is not going to be useful um, uh, for building our model, right? So that was part of what we were doing with looking at the correlation. So, so, so maybe if we have a column with missing data and it doesn't look like it's correlating really at all with the thing we're trying to predict, uh, you know, maybe we would be more inclined to just drop it there instead of trying to um, deal with the missing data uh, on that column, right? We could just drop that attribute sometimes. Um, but you know, the most common option is to try to fill it. So if there's not too much missing data um, and we think that that attribute might be useful, we might want to try and, 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 and somehow fill in the data that's missing, right? And there's lots of approaches you can use to fill in missing data. Um, so the simplest is you know, we might just fill in missing data with the, the mean or the median. Value for that attribute. So you know that that's that's just a good overall general guess, right? So uh, if we know nothing else about it, it's probably close to the the mean value for that that feature. Um, so if that if that feature or that attribute uh, looks like it's going to be really important, we might want to try and do something a little bit more sophisticated. So so we can we can. Um, Try to build a separate uh, machine learning uh, uh, classifier to try and predict what that value would be for those missing items, right? So a common thing you'll see is um, uh, use something like a K nearest neighbors, which is a, a method that we'll talk about to, to find the, the closest um, e existing um, data points. That, that don't have missing data for that one, uh, and then maybe average those uh, to come up with um, um, a prediction or a guess of what that missing value might be based on the most similar two or three or other um, rows that don't have the missing item for that data set. Um, but yeah, in, in um, we can use, you know, so, so scikit-learn has a bunch of things for imputing. Uh, which I don't know if that's an actual English word or not, but they call it calls those imputers for for um, um, filling in missing data. Right? Um, very easy methods. So like um, um, so the only one we give an example of in this um, lecture notebook and our lecture video is just using the median 
um, value. So it's so filling in missing values, which is whatever the median was for that, uh, that attribute. Um, um, All right, uh, um, there was a little bit of an aside then here. So, so um, uh, kind of as a um, 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 secondary goal of this chapter was to begin to understand the scikit-learn um, library that we're gonna be using uh, in this class, okay? So um, the, 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 the biggest thing to understand about scikit-learn is that, I mean, everything in it um, is kind of one of three basic types, it's either an estimator or a transformer or a predictor. Um, so most of the stuff that we're using uh, to do the data cleaning and stuff are examples of transformers. Um, and then our, the models that we train are examples of predictors. So, so, so predictors are actually um, both transformers and predictors for the most part. So you, you first uh, fit your model, so, so you, you, you transform it in order to train the model basically using the fit function, and then you can then use it to do predictions. Right? Uh, but, but all the, 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 the data cleaning things that we look at uh, in here are examples of um, uh, 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 fit transformers or estimator transformer objects. So they're combinations of estimators and transformers. Um, so I guess actually like most of the machine, machine learning predictors that we're using are all three. So that you, you first fit the model, that's kind of training, uh, you fit transform it to, to, to kind of train the model. And then after you've done that, you can use the predict method to make predictions with your model. Um, but anyway, I mean, this imputer basically that we show here is an example of a, oops, of a fit transformer. So somebody's drawing on here. So, um, and it's also important to understand this because we can also add our own um, transformers uh, or even predictors, but, but usually we want to add in our own transformers to build pipelines for certain things. And there's some examples of that, some simple examples of that. Um, yeah, a little bit later on here, so. Um, okay, and we already talked about this a little bit. Um, there was a question before, so there's, so besides numerical data um, and, and handling missing data, another thing is that, uh, so there's kind of two main categories of, of things uh, that, that at this point, if you're new to doing data analytics. Uh, so, so your data is either numerical um, and, and you kind of use one set of transformations and things to handle numerical data. But then you have these other kinds of data that's not really numerical, it's categorical, right? And then I guess a third class is really kind of string data. So it's a categorical data, um, 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 can be represented as strings or as integers, but um, um, uh, the, the difference between that and just a, a regular like string field uh, in, in a database um, is that categorical data, there's usually a finite number of them, right? So, so categorical data is um, 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 usually finite in, instead of, uh, of like an infinite number of possibilities, right? So, so again, an example might make this clearer than we talking about. So, so our one example of categorical data is we've got one attribute called ocean proximity, which is really a categorical uh, piece of information. There's really, what, they're really, um, so we can use like value counts on that column. Uh, and we see if there's one, two, three, four, there's five actual categories, although there's only two uh, for this one category, the island category, which is pretty small. Uh, so, you know, we might want to kind of throw that away. It's debatable whether it'd be useful to keep that in there. There's so few of those. Um, but, right, and then, but there's only these four or five, right? So one common way, we, we can't use spring data. So in our, in our original, um, 
file. This is actually encoded as strings, right? With these, with these, uh, the, these string uh, values here, right? Oh, and, and by the way, I mean again, this data is pretty clean. So, if this was a real data set before we did any training, and, and you know, the people were were entering this in, how they were entering it in some application, uh, it'd be likely that we'd see different different spellings of like inland, so maybe in with a space between inland. <laughs> So, oh, somebody, somebody has their uh, their mic on. So. Um, feel free if you have a question to to shout it out. Um, um, so anyway, this yeah, is that yeah. So. Um, Anyway, this data is relatively clean, right? But uh, uh, machine learning algorithms that, that we're using really have to have the data in numerical form. So we can't really feed them in raw strings like this. So um, whenever we have categorical data, we have to encode it. And there's two basic ways of encoding categorical data. So either as an integer, so that, that's the kind of easiest way to understand, right? So I've got five values, so I might just arbitrarily decide that the um, in this case, the um, um, so the first two are actually less than one hour from the ocean, so we encoded those as zeros. Um, and, and again, you know, scikit learn um, has methods, so th this is an example of a transformer method, another example of a transformer method. Um, this is a fit transformer, so if we ask, ask it to fit transform stuff that's um, uh, string like. It's a categorical variable. Um, it will arbitrarily assign, um, you know, zero to one of those strings, one to another string. So it's, it's assigning one to the um, the inland and it's assigning four to the near ocean, and so on. Um, so I talked a little bit about here. So th there's two really different types of categorical uh, things. So there, there's, there's things that are categorical that have a natural um, ordering to them. Um, and in this case, I mean, we might, there, there might really exist a natural ordering, right? So, so, uh, so the things that are closest to the ocean, like on the islands are the near ocean or the near bay, right? So these are the things that are probably like on the beachfront uh, or, or near the beachfront or, or actually on islands out in the ocean. Right. Um, so this this is ordered now from um, the closest to the ocean to the furthest away. So inland is probably the uh, properties or high, well districts um, in our database that are um, farthest away from the ocean. Right. So the the thing is, I mean, if there's a natural ordering, so, so um, uh, the problem with an arbitrary mapping of, of an integer to uh, a particular category is that um, machine learning algorithms, various ones that we use, will infer that there's some relate. So things that are closer, like one is closer to zero than it is to four. So so it's going to infer that that these are more similar than than, than the things that are further apart um, for our mapping. And if there's no particular ordering, that's a, that can be problematic having uh, this arbitrary mapping uh, where it's going to be inferring some similarity that doesn't exist. Uh, in our categories here, right? Um, so, I mean, so again, back to this, if there is a natural ordering, uh, if, if you're gonna convert it into this uh, ordinal categories, um, using like a, this ordinal encoder, uh, you, you might wanna take the time also to correctly order them. Right, so, so so by default it will choose a mapping which might not be the correct one, right? So, so you can you can specify um, what order to use. Um, but um, if your your category doesn't have uh, um, a natural ordering, right? So I mean I gave an example of this. So you know. 
I mean, what does it mean? I mean, can we think of what an ordering is? So, so maybe we could, maybe there's a natural ordering from the typical average salary for, for, for different um, job titles or something like that, that, that might be useful for the predictor we're trying to build, but then maybe not. So, so and, and you can think of other things where, where really the, the, uh, the, the categories have no possibility of having a natural order from least to most or from most similar to least similar. Right? So in that case, um, it's better to use a one-hot encoding. So a one-hot encoding basically just, uh, so in this case, we had, we had five categories in our, in our categorical um, variable here, five different categories. And this would, a uh, one-hot encoder would transform that into five columns, so five features, where um, each column represents the presence or the absence of that category. So the first two were the, um, the um, less than one hour from ocean, right? So you had a one there and a zero for the, all the other columns. And then the, the third one was inland, I think, um, and so on. So that, that's what the one I'm doing. Um, Right. And then you can build your own custom transformers, right? So uh, back on the previous notebook, I gave an example of feature engineering where we built some, you know, where, where we created some new features from existing features. Um, so of course, there's no um, scikit-learn transformer that can do that for you. You know, you have to write the code to actually um, define or create those new features, right? But you can you can add those into these transformer pipelines by creating a custom transformer. And there's an example of this in there. So basically you have to create a class um, and you have to implement like a fit and transform method, right? So like in this case, we don't really have to do anything to fit, to build a fit transformer. Um, so, so there's nothing to do to fit this. But if we're asked to transform um, a particular data frame that has, uh, you know, so a particular table that has, um, you know the, the the rooms and the, and the household. We can we can impute the the rooms per household like we did in the previous notebook by doing the same division again and and, and adding that column to the um, um, to our data frame or to our table here. So basically, what we're doing is we're creating those new. Um, attributes like we did in the previous notebook. And then this here actually adds those two columns or those three columns to X and it returns that, okay? And so, so we're not modifying the X that's passed in, we're creating a new table, adding in those two or three new columns that we define and we return that as the result of the transfer. So, 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 so when we come in, uh, we input, um, we're expecting a table to be input that has exactly the eight or nine columns, right? And then we're going to return it with um, 11 or 12 columns, depending on whether we added the two or the three here. Um, and then finally, in this notebook, um, um, so as, as I mentioned, um, are the, the attributes that we have the numerical attributes that we have can have very different scales, right? So, so if you go back to the previous notebook um, and, and look at the visualization, um, the histograms, um, you know, so some of these go like latitude and longitude go from negative 100 to um, the, um, the median age goes from zero to 50, the um, Median house value goes from zero to 500,000, right? So, so, so that's what we mean by a very different scale, right? So, so, so some of these are, are very small, some of these are negative. Um, um, you know, like, so this only goes from zero to 50 or zero to 40 um, for the, the latitude. But others go from zero to 500,000. So it's a very different scale in this case. And that can cause props, so not all <laughs> machine learning methods, but for some data with very different scale, um, the ones with the large scale will be inherently more important than the ones with, with a, a relatively small scale. 
So uh, when we're working with machine learning models um, that are sensitive to scale, uh, we, we have to scale them to all have a similar scale. So th there's two basic ways to do that. There's min-max scaling um, for their standardization. Um, So min-max scaling basically just scales everything to have a value between zero and one. So it's pretty easy to do that by hand, but you can also just use a, um, a um, um, scikit-learn also has transformers for, for or scale, transfer for doing this kind of scaling. Um, So no, in, in the first case, we, we, we transform to the min-max, so min, a min of zero and a max of one. So if you replot, you'll see that all of the features after you do that transformation all have the values now between zero. To compare that back to the previous, it means exactly the same distribution. It's just that we've rescaled all the features to be between zero and one, right? Same distribution, but, but now everything's between zero and one. Likewise, we can we can scale to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So again, it's exactly the same distributions, but now all the, the value, all the, the features have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Right. All right. And then um, at the last thing here, we can combine all of that. Um, so what we'll normally be doing is, def is defining what are called pipelines to do all the transformations that we need, gather those into one spot, right? So all the transformations that we talked about, um, transforming the categorical variable into a one-hot encoding, uh, doing the feature scaling on the numerical variables, uh, filling in the missing values on the numerical variables, uh, we, we do all of that. Um, you know, so we've got two pipelines, one, uh, fills in the missing values, uh, adds in the, those engineered features, and then scales using standard scaling. So a mean of zero, a standard deviation of one. That's the numerical pop pipeline. Um, and then um, um, that with this uh, one hot encoding pipeline to get all of those with one um, call. So, so by doing a fit transform, on this pipeline, we do all of those um, data cleaning that we talked about in one step from the raw housing data to what we call the housing prepared. Okay? And then, so everything when we're, we're fitting and training models, we're actually using this prepared data from this pipeline to do it in the next um, notebook here. All right. Um, and then I think I'm going to have to, to, to kind of wrap up here. Um, and uh, this notebook has some cells that will take some time to do. So there's some examples of actually training models here, um, right? So we start with a very simple model, um, um, uh, like a linear regression, right? And, and again, you know, I don't expect you to know what lin linear regression is or what um, uh, a random forest is, which are the two I think that we use as examples here. So we'll talk about those in this class. Here, um, but but we fit a, a type of, of model to the data. So fitting a model is, is as simple as again, you know, the, this this linear regression model is a an example of a fit transform predict um, object. So it, it does all three. So so we fit it to the um, cleaned data that we've already cleaned above here, um, and uh, the fitting is basically training. Okay, so given the in the, the, the clean data, and this is this is um, um, these are examples of um, supervised learning. Um, so so we, we've got the input data that was clean, and we want to train a model to learn to predict our house prices, which is in the housing labels. Right? And once we've trained um, our linear regression regression model. Um, we can um, call the predict method then to make predictions, right? So basically, so like in this example, we pass in five house, uh, you know, five districts and, and get predictions for those. So the output is gonna be a predicted median house price for each of these five districts um, that we pull out here, right? Um,
And we'll talk more about doing cross-validation training um, in this class here. I think I'm going to leave that for when we get into the details of this. Actually, next week, we'll, we'll talk in more detail about doing trained test splits um, and then also about um, doing K-fold cross-validation. So. And then finally, um, so um, often for these models, um, they, they take what are known as metaparameters, right? So, so these are different settings um, that can make the, the model perform better or worse on the, the, the data that you're trying to train with, right? So, so often though, you don't know what the, the settings of those metaparameters should be, okay? So in this case, in our second example, we're using a different type of machine learning method called a random forest. Um, and, and it's doing regression in this case, so random force regressor. Um, but, but it looks kind of the same then. So, so instead of using the linear regressor, we, we use the random form regressor, but we fit it to the data. So we train it uh, on, our, uh, on our cleaned data here with the same labels. And then we can evaluate it using our prediction here. Um, but if we want to improve that model, we might have to tweak the metaparameters, right? So the random force takes parameters like the number of random estimators that we want to train it with, um, and then the max number of features to use. So, so our data set had like 16 features total after we cleaned it. So here we're using only two, four, six, up to eight, up to half of the features, um, and um, some other things. So you can actually um, systematically search all the combination of these metaparameters to try and improve the performance of your um, of your model using this type of a grid switch. Um, All right, so that, that's kind of real quickly, especially on the last one here, um, and, but that's fine because the, you know, the last one is really meant to be just an example of what we're going to be doing. So, so we will get into the details of all of this, of, of the different kinds of models. Um, so we're going to look at, at, in this class, we're going to look at linear regression and logistic regression, and we're going to look at, at ensembles like random trees, um, uh, random forests, uh, or basic trees, and then um, um, random trees and things. Uh, we'll look at support vector machines and, and, and a few other types of machine learning um, algorithms. Um, but before we get to those, uh, we're going to be doing some more uh, more details on kind of these things here at the end. So about um, uh, about uh, so selecting and training a model, um, and, and then how you evaluate the model, um, and then you know splitting up your data into training and test sets and then splitting up a, a training set even further uh, into training and validation data to do cross-validation. Um, so all those things are kind of coming in the future. This is only kind of a taste of those. So. Um, okay, any questions? I know I kind of went relatively fast through those, but, but um, especially the last part there. But, you know, like I said, you know, the, the, I spent a lot more time um, on the three lecture videos that you should watch here um, at the start of this week. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and end the session there then um, so I can get this video um, created and I'll upload it as usual. Um, although, you know, again, you know, the, the session, um, I'm mostly kind of just going over things and trying to get a, a chance for people to ask questions, right? Um, so, you know, if you want more details, you should watch the uh, the canned lecture videos um, um, for these three lecture notebooks. So. All right, so last chance. If not, that's uh, it for this. Um, send questions by email if you have them, um, and I will see you guys later then.